welcome everybody to the well at STSA. And one of the things that we always say here at the well is that we are an ordinary place where extraordinary things happen. And we believe that we are in an ordinary room and it's just a normal place. We're all ordinary people. But when we invite God into our midst, then extraordinary things happen. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm feeling today is going to be one of those extra, extra, extraordinary days. And I'm telling you, there's very few Sundays that I've been as excited as I am for today. Because today what I am praying and what I'm really believing and hoping is going to happen is that some people are going to find freedom from something that has been enslaving them for years. And I truly believe that today could be that day for you, for the person sitting next to you or somebody here today. Because what we're going to talk about here today is something that each and every single person deals with inside their hearts. It's what I'm going to call today a silent killer, an assassin inside the hearts of each and every single one of us that hopefully today we can eliminate from, from our lives and live free. But before we do that, I want to tell you all a story about a man that you may have heard of. Raise your hand if you ever heard of a guy named Hank Gathers. Hank Gathers? Okay, a few people, not too many people. So I'll tell a little bit of his story. Hank Gathers was one of the best college basketball players of his generation. All right, he went to a school called Loyola Marymount over in California back in the late 80s, early 90s. I want to say 1987, 86, 87, 89, somewhere around there. And Hank Gathers was one of the best players in all of college basketball. He was one of only two players, only two players in the history of all of college basketball to ever lead the entire nation in both rebounding and scoring. Okay, he was that good, and he was good on the inside and good on the outside. Like he could shoot the three, but he could also go down low and rebound and bang with the big guys. As a, in his final year, it was 1990, was his senior year, he was being projected as a top five to seven pick in the National Basketball Association. This guy had everything going for him, and he was a candidate for, a, for the player of the year, and his team was going to challenge for the national championship in college basketball. And then March 4th, 1990 came. And you can go to YouTube when you, can go, when you go home and you can watch this video for yourself because it's all live, happened live on television. Hank Gathers playing in a basketball game against a team called the Portland Pilots. The Portland Pilots. Early first half, LMU, Loyola Marymount is crushing them. And Hank Gathers is running the floor and he gets an alley-oop pass. His point guard threw from about midcourt. Huge, long alley-oop pass, probably 30-foot, 40-foot pass. He caught it, and he slam-dunked it home, and the crowd went wild. Hank Gathered collected himself, started to jog back down court. Right about when he got to mid-court, he collapsed. He stopped breathing, and he was dead before he made it to the hospital. He suffered from a condition called, let me get this right, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I don't know what that means. But apparently back in 1990, I don't know what about today, but back in 1990, it was an imperceptible condition which gave very few signs and no one knew about until unfortunately Hank Gathers died at the age of 20 years old, unfortunately way too young and way too tragically. Now here's the part of the story that's the worst part of it. On the outside, Hank Gathers was in great shape. Better shape than you and better shape than me. Very few people could say they were in as good a shape, especially if you remember, for those who are basketball fans, those Loyola Marymount teams were known for their up and down style. They used to run a lot. Okay, and they were the best conditioned athletes in all of NCAA. They used to score, like, I think I want to say four of the top four, four of the top five ever uh, scoring points in a game was held by this team in this era. Okay, they were a running gun team, highly conditioned. On the outside, it appeared that Hank Gathers was in better shape than everyone else who stepped on the court. But this was a reminder for us that how you look on the outside doesn't always signify how you're doing on the inside. And the same is true spiritually. And what we're going to talk about here today is something that I believe that many of us struggle with on the inside but hide very well on the outside. But there is a silent killer that just like Hank Gathers, whose outside health was great. But what we learned with Hank Gathers, we're going to learn with ourselves as well, is that your outside health isn't as important as your inside health. And Jesus hits on this silent killer in our passage for today from Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. Jesus says this. He says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, 
And whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus said, you heard that murder is wrong and that murder will be punished and that murder has consequences. Well, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be in danger of those same consequences. Hold on. Time out. Let's be logic. Logically, this statement doesn't make any sense. I can find holes in this statement right off the bat. The first hole that I find is Jesus says about being angry. Well, wasn't Jesus angry? Didn't Jesus get angry? Didn't Jesus, as he's famously portrayed in, in, in the passage where he went to the temple in John chapter 2, he went into the temple and he started flipping tables and yelling at them. You have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And he went crazy on them. He was angry. God of the Old Testament, we see so many times in the Old Testament, God talks about his anger is aroused and his anger is on the people who have betrayed him. And by the way, when we talk about anger, isn't anger an emotion? How can I say you're not allowed, like, don't be angry? Isn't that like saying, like, don't be hungry? Like, how can I control an emotion? And in addition to that, isn't there a verse in the Bible, a verse in the Bible that says, be angry and, finish it, be angry and, do not sin. So how can Jesus say that anger is wrong? Is he contradicting the rest of the scripture? No, Jesus isn't contradicting the rest of the scripture. And Jesus is completing the rest of the scripture because there's two kinds of anger. And when you understand that the way that Jesus said this expression and the way you understand the entire picture of the Bible, you'll see there's two kinds of anger that are spoken about. There's inside anger and outside anger. Outside anger is usually what we think about. Yelling, getting upset. Uh, when he told the Pharisees that you guys are like whitewashed tombstones and you guys are, 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 are hurting the kingdom of God and you are neither going in yourself and you're stopping others, yelling at people. That's outside anger. Inside anger is the resentment, the grudge, the bitterness, the hatred. That's the murderous anger, that anger of the heart. And Jesus did, see, we do the opposite, okay? Jesus did the opposite of us. Jesus was angry on the outside. He was angry on the outside. And that's why that verse says, be angry and do not sin. He was angry and he yelled at people, but he never had anger on the inside. He never let it lead to hatred or grudge or bitter or resent. We're the opposite. We're nice on the outside. And then inside, we murder in our hearts. Outside, we're okay. We're not angry people. Hey, we're going to talk about anger today. I don't got a problem with that. I got that one under control. Yeah, you got it on the outside under control. But I bet you that if we look inside that heart of yours, we might find some stuff in there that you didn't know was in there. That's the kind of anger that Jesus talks about. One of the, the fathers of our church, St. John Chrysostom, says it this way. He says, Christ, in this verse, does not speak of anger of the flesh, but anger of the heart. That's what I'm saying. He does not speak of anger of the flesh. This is not about anger of the flesh. This is about anger of the heart. For the flesh cannot be so disciplined as not to feel the passion. Meaning, it's impossible to not get angry at times. It is impossible. It's an emotion that you can't control. But what you do on that, you can control. He goes on. When then a man is angry, but refrains from doing what his anger prompts him, his flesh is angry, but his heart is free from anger. What does it mean when we talk about anger of the heart? What are the consequences of anger of the heart? If you don't know how to deal with this anger, the grudge, the bitterness, the hatred, all, like keep going, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to use all those terms interchangeably today. Why is it murder? It'll kill your relationships. It'll kill your spiritual life. It'll kill any chance you have of love, joy, peace, kindness, all those fruits of the Spirit. It'll kill your ability to ultimately be happy and satisfied in life if you do not learn how to deal with the silent killer of the anger of the heart. You cannot live freely or love freely when you have bitterness and resentment going on inside you. And like we learned with Hank Gathers, you can do all the right thing on the outside. You can say the right words. You can say the right prayers. You can do all the right things on the outside. But if that guy's inside you, man, it's just a matter of time before you fall and drop dead, whether spiritually or emotionally or relationally or your family or your career. It's just a matter of time because you have a ticking time bomb inside of you. Our topic for today is understanding how to not be angry with our brother. Understanding why it's bad and understanding what we can do about it. 
But before I get into it, okay, before I get into this specifically, let me just kind of answer one question right off the bat that you might be thinking. Many translations of the Bible, actually I shouldn't say many, one translation of the Bible, but it's a very common one, the verse looks different than what you have up here on the screen. Did you notice that? If you go, most people, like if you have a New King James Bible or a King James, King James is, the, is translated to King James, and then later on someone just made King James into newer English, but it's the same translation. King James Bible says it differently. What does it say? It says, I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause. No translation of the Bible has it, this phrase, without a cause, except King James's translation. Why does King James have it in there? Is it right or is it not right? Is it right to say without a cause or not right to say without a cause? Is it right or not right? Jesus' entire ministry was based on treating people not based on what they deserve. Because in the same passage, this is Matthew 5, 21, a few verses later, he's going to talk about love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who persecute you and spitefully use you. When Jesus is up on the cross, he doesn't say, uh, do they deserve or they don't, is there a cause? Like Jesus had a cause to be angry on the cross, didn't he? He had a cause to be angry. The entire Christianity is not based on that we love people if they don't do bad stuff to us. You know why King James added without a cause? The historians, you know why? King James had a fight with his brother. King James and his brother didn't get along. Something about marriage. One of them married the other one's wife or something like that. I don't remember the exact story. So King James saw this verse and he said, whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. He said, no, 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 Add in there without a cause. And I'm serious. That's a story. That's why no other translation has it. And you just figured out yourself why you cannot say angry without a cause. Because who determines the cause? Because I never met one person who's angry and hates someone else who doesn't have a just cause for it. So who determines the cause? Do I determine the cause? Or do I ask the person, I'm angry at you. Is there a good cause for that? That's not Jesus' ministry at all. Jesus' ministry is very, very clear. That whoever, whoever has this inside anger in his heart is in danger, with or without a cause. Let's go logically here, and let's try to break this down. Last week, for those who are here, we looked at God's standard for our sexuality. And what we saw in Matthew 5, 26, is that Jesus put a standard on sex and sexuality that is very different than our standard. And we saw that Jesus kind of set the standard, and over the years, we kind of moved all the way over here, and all of a sudden, Jesus said, that's the standard, and then we had to reset ourselves to his standard. And we saw that his standard of sexuality is much different. That's the whole ethics versus obedience thing. We're not comparing ourselves to the society around us, we're comparing ourselves to the standard that Jesus set. We're going to see the same thing with anger today. Because with the standard that Jesus set, we kind of watered it down and eroded a little bit and kind of came up with our own configuration. Let's go back in time, not back in time, but let's go back to Jesus' command and understand why anger of the heart, why bitterness, why resentment, why grudge, why all these things are not compatible with the way of life. All right, this whole series we're talking about, there's two roads, the way of death and the way of life. And Jesus is saying that this inner anger is not compatible with this road, so you must get rid of it. Let's understand why. Understanding anger. Think to yourself, each one, think to themselves. When was the last time you got angry? All right, think to yourself of the last time that you got angry. Was it with your spouse, your kids, your boss, certainly not with your priest. When was the last time you got angry? And every one of us, like, it shouldn't be hard to think of when we got angry. Okay, and some people look at me like, yeah, 10 minutes ago, all right, on the way to church this morning, all right. When was the last time you got angry? Now ask yourself, why did I get angry? What was the root of it? And don't say, because she, don't say that. Ask yourself why, when she, or when he, or when they, why that made me angry. What bothered me? Why is it troubling me? Your spouse uh, didn't call and they came home late from work. You got angry. Why did that make you angry? Uh, your boss uh, asked you to stay late on a Friday when you had plans. Why did that make you angry? Your uh, friend 
forgot your birthday. He didn't say happy birthday. Jerk. All right. Why did that make you angry? Think to yourself, what was the cause? And I bet you I'll answer to you the question of right now of what made you angry. Behind the huffing and puffing, the ranting and raving, the screaming, the going ballistic, I bet you the root of all the anger is this. The root of anger is I didn't get something that I want. I didn't get something that I want. And therefore, I'm angry at you because you owe me. If you want to break anger down into one phrase, what is anger? It is you owe me. There is a debt to debtor relationship that has been created by your behavior. You owe me affection. You owe me this promotion. You owe me a birthday celebration and you owe me to feel good on my birthday. You owe me. You talk about me behind my back. You took away what I didn't get what I want. You gossip about me. So I wanted a reputation and you gave me a different reputation. You owe me my reputation. My father left our family when we were young. So he took away, I didn't get the childhood that I wanted. And I'm angry because he owes me my childhood back. He took it from me. My spouse who cheated on me, she took away my dream or he took away our dream, our, our, our security. He took away all my plans. All of anger breaks down into, I wanted something, I didn't get it, you owe me. That's why when you talk about anger, the expression that you'll always hear is I need to get even, right? I need to get even. I'm gonna get even with that person. I'm gonna get even with them for what they did. Get even implies what? They took something from me, there has to be payback. They took something. You show me an angry person, I will show you someone who feels someone owes him something in life. A hurt person who feels like someone took something from them and I gotta get payback. And you owe me, either you owe me an apology, or you owe me uh, a, a, a financial, or you owe me a gift, like you owe me something, you took something from me, and until you pay me back, you're in debt to me, and I'm gonna be angry about it. Well, what's the problem with the logic of I didn't get what I want, therefore you owe me? What's the problem? First problem is 99% of the debts cannot be repaid. I said a dad abandoned a child, I lost my childhood. How are you gonna repay that? How am I gonna give you back your teenage years? I said, husband cheated on his wife, took away that security. How are you gonna give that security back? You can talk, you can say nice words, but I can't give you back your security. I cannot, I took, I said this gossip about you, I took away your reputation. How am I gonna give you back your reputation? I can, there's certain things that cannot be paid back. And then when the offended party realizes that, that you cannot pay me back for what you took from me, then I get even more angry. And then I get even more grudge, and I get even more bitter, and I get even more resentful. The second problem with this way of thinking is when I say, you owe me, you need to pay me back. Who is now strong and who is now weak? By me saying, you owe me, I've made myself the weaker. When I say, ever say this expression, that person makes me so mad. You said that, right? That person makes me so mad. You know what you've said? You've said, I'm weak. Because I do not have the ability to make myself happy. Only they do. They control my happiness and my madness. They control my ability to smile or frown. You make me so mad. You know what I tell people when they come to me and tell me, this person makes me so mad? I ask them, sometimes, especially if I'm depending on, these, like, sometimes I'm not the most sensitive, okay, but <laughs> try to prove a point. I pull out a calendar. I used to have a calendar in my office. I point to the calendar. Okay, what day are you going to stop letting that person control your life? I said, what do you mean? I said, right now they're controlling your life. You tell me that that person makes me so mad. You're telling me you refuse to be happy unless they do this. Okay, that's fine. Look at the calendar. Choose a date. How long are you continue to let them be in control of your life? How long you continue to be weak? How long are you, continue, are you going to continue to be a victim to the crime that they committed. They committed a crime against you in 1986, and you've allowed them to commit that same crime every single day that you hold that grudge. Someone hurt you when you were a child, and by holding on to the anger and the bitterness and the resentment and the grudge, you continue to allow them to hurt you day after day after day. I read you a quote 
from a book that's called Healing the Angry Brain by a PhD guy, not a Christian guy, but he's just a smart guy. He said about this topic of holding on to grudges, even though the offense may be long over, people keep thinking obsessively about what happened. The problem with this is that every time the memory comes, they feel re-injured as if they are being betrayed in that exact moment once again. Every time I think about my grudge, I'm opening the hurt once again. And where is this person who hurt me? This person who hurt me may live, may have moved to Alaska, may have completely repented for their sin. May, they may not even be alive. I, they, might, they might have completely moved on. They don't even remember this, but I'm giving them power over my day today. I will not be calm with my wife and my kids because something that someone who's moved on a long time ago did to me years ago and I'm allowing my kids and my wife and my friends and, and, and the Starbucks clerk to suffer because something that somebody did 10 years ago who that person doesn't even, not even a person that I like and I'm giving him control of my life and a person doesn't even remember. Those who focus on payback, those who focus on you owe me, are the people who you would characterize as an angry person. Like we all get angry at times, but then you know there's certain people who are angry people. Okay, you know the angry people. You avoid them like the plague. You don't knock, kids don't knock at their door on Halloween. All right, the angry people. I guarantee you, you go to that angry person, it's going to come back to somebody owes me something and I will not let go of that grudge. So what do we do? What do we do? Payback isn't going to solve it. Payback, first of all, is not possible majority of time. And even if it was possible, it isn't going to solve the problem because you can't really return those things that were taken away. So what are we going to do? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 gives us some good advice. This is what St. Paul says. He says, let all bitterness... All wrath, all anger, all clamor, and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger. See how he's, he's, he's reaching out for, you call it whatever you want to call it. You justify it, you spiritualize it, you give it whatever term you want. That negative emotion inside you that is holding you. Whatever it may be, you put it away from you. You know what the expression, be put away from you? You know what that expression implies or the picture that it draws? You know when you're walking and you walk into like a spider web? You know when you walk into a spider web, okay? What do you do when you walk into a spider web? Like, you freak out, right? You just like frantically start pulling stuff and get it off me and get it out. And you pull at your hair, your ears, your nose, like get it off me. Because you know how you feel like you just can't, you, like you... That's exactly what this expression is. Anger, just get it off, frantically. Pull it away. Get it away from me. This thing is killing me. This thing hurts me. Malice, grudge, anger, wrath, get it away from me. The attitude that we need to have is not to look at the anger and, and you know, it's nice anger and put it on the shelf. Anger, man, get that thing away from me because I know that stuff is going to kill me and I can't stand to have that stuff on me. Now, the how is that last part. How do you get rid of anger? I'm gonna say a bad word right now. I'm gonna say a word that if you're an angry person, you don't wanna hear. I'm gonna say the F word. <laughs> Forgiveness. Come on, man. <laughs> but everyone perked up for that one. <laughs> you know what? I'll be honest with you, as offensive as that F word, which you're thinking, <laughs> might be, this F word is more offensive. This F word, let me stop saying F word, okay. <laughs> this word is a highly offensive word to people who are angry. And I've sat there, people come to me and tell me horror, horror stories. Like I'm telling you, like I want you to understand that when I'm telling you forgiveness, that I'm not just saying like someone, you know, nicked your toe oh, as they were walking by you and, for, oh, we need to, I'm not talking like that. I'm talking about I've had people sit in my office and tell me, I had one person tell me how when they were young, they went to a therapist, okay, because they were struggling with some issues and that therapist raped them. 
I know a girl who told me when she was young, a young girl, that her father would hold a knife to her tongue and tell her if she doesn't stop crying, he's going to cut her tongue off. I'm telling you, people have been hurt. Like, I'm not just saying, like, for, I, I'm, I'm telling you what I'm saying. I know people have been hurt. And I know you, as you're sitting there in this room, you've been hurt. And I'm not denying that in any way. But I'm telling you, like I tell people, and that's what I'm saying, it's an offensive word. But I'm coming at it and saying, you need to forgive that person. You need to forgive someone who raped you. You need to forgive a father who put a knife to your tongue. You need to forgive my best friend who stabbed me in the back. I can't do that. And I'm telling you, this forgiveness word sounds easy. It sounds easy. This is the hardest thing. This is the one thing that I, I, I've told people many, many things, many, many things to do. This is the one that I get the most pushback on because this is the one that this person did, took this away from me. They owe me. I cannot let them off the hook. They do not deserve to be let off the hook. And if, they, if I let them off the hook, it's like supporting what they did. I will not forgive this person. Let's take a step back before we get into the how to forgive, let's understand what is forgiveness. We're going to define forgiveness by looking at a passage in Scripture from Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, St. Peter, who's one of the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, comes to him and opens the subject of forgiveness. And he says it this way. Then Peter came to him, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now understand the way Peter is saying this. Peter is asking about forgiveness to what degree? And when he says up to seven times, like he's doing it in what kind of a spirit? Like a little bit of like bragging. Like, Lord, I know that you teach us to forgive. I know you teach love. Well, how often should we forgive? I, unlike those guys, have forgiven seven times. And seven is a lot. Like imagine someone talks bad about you and you forgive them and they talk about it and you forgive like seven times is a lot like he's take, saying it in like a bragging kind of a way like tell these other heathens to be as spiritual as me because i have forgiven seven times my brother who sinned against me first mistake peter made and we're going to see this throughout is peter is thinking right now this will get this one this is very important peter is thinking right now that forgiveness is for the benefit of who Peter's saying, I've done it seven times. He is thinking in his mind, forgiveness benefits the offender. That's what he's thinking. That's why he's saying, how much benefit should I give them? I've given them seven times. Surely that's enough. Peter is going to see in a minute that forgiveness has nothing to do with the offender. It has all to do with the offendee. He's going to see that right now. How many times? Up to seven times, Jesus kind of smirks, smiles at him, and says, have a seat, Peter. Let me tell you a story. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. And of course, you can imagine Peter, seven times? And Jesus said, how about 70 times seven? You can just imagine Peter. And he tells him a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and that th all that he had and that payment be made. Stories of a simple story about a man who had a servant, had many servants. One servant owed him 10,000 talents. Let's say $10,000 for our sake. Owed him $10,000. The man could not pay. So therefore, a debt relationship was established. You owe me $10,000. You can't pay. So what does the, what does the, the, the master do? He says, I'm going to sell the wife and sell the children and sell everything he has to get his debt back. That was within his right to do. Like, this is not bad. The king was not doing something bad right here. He's saying, you, as a servant, you owed me this amount. I'm going to sell you as a servant to someone else and your wife and your kids so you can pay me back, even though you're not going to get me $10,000. You, at best, you get me five, dollars $600, something like that, on the open market. But the going rate for a servant was not 10,000 talents. So the master, within his right, says, I'm going to sell you. The servant, can he pay back the debt? No. So what does the servant do? Only thing he can do. Now the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. See the relationship now between debt and forgiveness? 
he forgave him the debt. The man begged, pleaded, I can't, I can't ever pay you back. So luckily, the master was compassionate, and he said, okay, you know what? I cancel the debt. I forgive the debt. You don't owe me anymore. You don't owe me anymore. Okay, so far so good. Story continues. Verse, next verse. In, in a perfect what are the chances moment, this is a one, what are the chances moment, okay, what happens right next. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. So imagine $10,000 to $100, and it's even less, okay, because talent's more than denarii. But think $10,000 to $100. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. You owed me $100, pay me what you owe. Within his right to do, okay, maybe the throat thing was a little much, but within his right to demand payback for what was taken from him. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Don't read the next verse. What should happen next? This is a, this is a perfect, like this is Jesus telling a parable. One man who was forgiven and then another one who had a little, like you know how the story ends. The story should end. Like what are the chances that you're forgiven $10,000 the same day that someone owes you $100? Like what are the chances of that? So surely the story will end. He'll say, okay, he forgave him the debt as well. But this is where it takes a little bit of a curveball. But he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. He said, you took this from me. You owe me. Please forgive me. Cancel my debt. I will not cancel your debt. You will pay me back. Story goes on. So when all his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, and rightly so. You understand why. And came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. If you're a listener of this parable, how are you feeling so far? Is everyone okay with this? So far, so good. Like so far, Jesus didn't say anything shocking. Jesus said a man was canceled $10,000 and then he wouldn't cancel $100. So that's why he's saying, so shouldn't I, like should not you have also have had compassion on your fellow servant? The answer is yes, you should have. So the guy throws him in prison. No problem so far. One last verse. And this last verse is the zinger that sticks it to him. Jesus comes back to the first question of Peter, and he says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Boom. Peter, I forgive seven times. I'm the man. Oh, really? Listen to this story. And each of you, you do not forgive from your heart, not seven times, not eight times, not nine times, not ten times. Each of you, if you don't spider web, get away from me, anger. And so your heavenly father will do to you. Jesus explained the parable. There's a king, there's a servant, there's a second servant. Who's the king? Who's the king? It's God. Who's the first servant? The one who was forgiven 10,000. That's anybody who has been forgiven by God. Anybody who has been forgiven by God. So if you have ever committed a crime against God, a sin against God, and said, God, forgive me, and he has forgiven you, you're the first servant. Who is the second servant? Anyone who has sinned against you. Anyone who talked bad about you? Anyone who offended you? Anyone who ridiculed you? Anyone who stole your job? Anyone who messed you up as a child? Anyone who's done any offense to you is that second servant. And you as the first servant, if you do not forgive from your heart, his brother, his trespasses, so the king, who is God, will do to each one of us. Jesus is clear. Give me a definition of forgiveness based on this story. Because this is where we struggle. What does it mean to forgive? Did I forgive? Did I not forgive? Forgiveness, I'll make it very, very clear for you. Very simple Bible language. To forgive equals to cancel the debt. I said... That anger, you took this from me, you owe me. Forgiveness is 
you don't owe me any more. Isn't that what the master did? You owe me 10,000. I forgive the debt. Even the expression that you hear in banks, okay, that the debt was forgiven, okay? It means you don't owe me any more. Now, let, let, let's be honest. This is not an easy saying. And like I said, I've sat with people who have really, really been hurt. And I'm making the assumption right now that the people who are in this room that I'm speaking to right now, the same people that I'm saying cancel the debt, I'm saying I know you've been hurt too. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Your dad was a jerk. Your mom was wrong. Your boss cheated you. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Your friend stabbed you in the back. I'm giving you all that benefit of the doubt. Isn't it kind of insensitive of me? And you thought that when I said that. Isn't it insensitive of me to stand in front of somebody who has been treated so poorly and so badly and say, you have to cancel their debt? Like, who are you? Like, excuse me. Like, let's be honest. Excuse me, sir. Who are you to tell me to cancel my debt? You didn't have my dad. You didn't have my mom. You don't know what they did to me. That kind of insensitive of you to just stand there and say, forgive the debt. Most people, if you tell them they need to cancel that, say, mind your own business. You don't know what I've been through. And then on top of that, you're going to come to me and tell me that God is going to punish me for being a victim of hurt? God is going to punish me? Is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm saying? If that's what you're hearing, you're not hearing what God is saying. Because what I said from the start is that all of God's ethics, this whole series, is not based on what God wants. Remember, I've said this so many times. Help me out here. Not what God wants from us, but what God wants for us. He is not saying, you better forgive or I'm going to punish you. He is saying, you better forgive or you are punishing yourself. You are punching yourself in the head every time that you hold on to that grudge. You are killing yourself. You are killing your relationships. You are killing your future. You are committing murder, not against the other guy. You're committing murder against yourself every time you hold on to that grudge. I'm not telling you forgive or I punish you. I say forgive or you punish yourself. Because believe me, and you know this to be true, the most self-destructive thing you will ever do in life is hold on to a grudge. You want to throw your life down the toilet? You let bitterness inside your heart and you leave it there. And it will destroy you like termites inside the house in the basement. They tear your house apart. But like Hank gathers, you won't see it happening until the whole thing comes crumbling down. And your whole house come crumbling down. Jesus gave us a hard commandment right here. Jesus gave us a hard saying. Jesus is saying, from your heart, cancel the debt. Let go of what that person did. That ain't easy. And I bet you when Peter heard this, I bet you when Peter heard this, he didn't fully get it. But I bet you you know when he got it? I bet you he got it a few months, maybe a year later. When St. Peter, as well as all the disciples, watched their master, who committed no crime, who never even spoke a bad word, never even spoke a bad word about somebody, like never even spoke a bad word about somebody, never even thought a bad thought about somebody, get betrayed, get arrested, get put on a phony trial, get beaten, get whipped, get spat upon, get nailed to a cross, get hung on a cross like a criminal. And what did Jesus say? What was the very, very first thing? The whole time he was on trial, the people were saying, are you this and are you that? And they're making fun of him and they're accusing him. He didn't open his mouth. He hung on the cross. What was the first thing that he said from his mouth? Luke 23, verse 34. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What did he do? The people are crucifying him. They owed him. There's a debt that has been established there. You accused me, you judged me, you crucified me, and I was 100% innocent. You owe me. And he said, God, Father, erase their debt. Not because there was a just cause, like I said in the beginning. Not because they, they didn't know. They knew. But Jesus says, I let them go. I don't hold this debt against them. And when Jesus said, I cancel this debt, 
It cost him his very blood. Whereas when we're asked to cancel our debt, it doesn't cost us much more than our pride. A little bit of our pride that we could stand to lose a little bit of it, to be honest. He gave his very life. What does it mean to forgive, to cancel the debt? What's the model that we're going to use? Write this down. The model of forgiveness. And I want you to write this exact expression. Even as God and Christ forgave you. That's what St. Paul said in Ephesians 4.32. That's our standard. We're going to memorize that verse. We are forgiving one another even as God and Christ forgave you. But you don't know what they did. And you don't know how hard it is. And you don't know. And Okay, all those things work if you're talking to me. But you're going to stand in front of Christ on the cross and say that I've been treated so badly. He says, Father, forgive them. And you say that you can't say it because you've been treated worse? Like you have an excuse? You have an alibi? You have a justification that he on the cross didn't have? You see, if you don't understand your own forgiveness, you will never understand the ability to forgive someone else, ever. And unless you are forgiven, you can never truly forgive because you're putting forgiveness in human terms and you can't understand forgiveness in human terms. If I look at your offense against me, your offense to me in a human way, and I say forgiveness, it seems like I'm rewarding your behavior. It seems like I'm letting you off the hook and just in a human way. But in the shadow of the cross and the $10,000 debt that I've been forgiven, and then say, go forgive that guy, forgiveness makes a lot more sense. And now it's no more an undue reward for a bad guy. It's one person who has been given a $10,000 cancellation on their debt, canceling a much smaller debt with someone against us. Anyone who struggles with forgiveness, I guarantee you, is thinking of what was done to them, not for them. Anyone who struggles to forgive is because their focus is on what was done to them, not on what was done for them. And that's why our model is even as God and Christ forgave us. We are not called to forgive as others forgive us. We are not called to forgive as others forgive us. We are not called to treat others in the way that others treat us. We are called to forgive others as God in Christ forgave us. And I like even that expression, even as. Like, even as. You might want to circle that one if you struggle with forgiveness. Because you may say, even this, even as God and Christ forgave us. Meaning, forgiveness, forgiveness, even as God and Christ forgave us. We are not called to treat each other as we treat each other. We're called to treat each other as God has treated us. And God and Christ forgave us for our sins. And you know what else I like about this verse? Is the first part where it says, we are not just going to forgive one another. We are going to be forgiving one another. What's the difference? And not just I stand up here and say, I forgive you. As I stand up here, like I take my lovely wife right there, and I say that I've sinned against her, okay, and she sinned against me, and the only way any relationship between two people works is there's forgiveness. And I say, I'm sorry she forgives me, and she says she's sorry, and I forgive her. And I'm not just saying, I forgive you. I'm saying, tomorrow I'm going to forgive you again. And the next day, I'm going to forgive you again. And the next day, and vice versa. I'm not just saying, okay, it's both ways. The only way any relationship between two human beings on this planet will work is if there is a forgiving mentality. Not I forgive you, but I'm telling you today, I'm going to forgive you tomorrow. There may be some situations that deal with consequences and things like that, but there will always be a canceling of the debt. Why? Why? Because of that person? Not because of this person. Because they deserve it? No, because I deserve it. I deserve to live free. I deserve to be able to love people with all my heart. I deserve to pass on to the next generation, my children. I deserve to pass on to them, not bitterness and not grudges, because you know this stuff goes from generation to generation. And if you are a bitter person, you will pass it on to your children. And if you hold grudges, you will pass it on to your children. I, my children, I deserve to pass on to my children a heart that's free to love freely and not in prison of bitterness and resentment. Look at Jesus. Again, look at Jesus when he was on the cross. St. Paul says, or St. Peter says this about Jesus when he was crucified. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, 
nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. This is the best part. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. You know what Christ was? Christ was an actor, not a reactor. If you're holding on to a grudge, you have made yourself weak. You have made yourself a reactor. That person's behavior dictates my response. And I'm telling you that no one has the power to make me a miserable person. No one, I will not give you the power, no matter what you do to me, I will not, through bitterness and resentment and grudges, give you the power to destroy my life, to destroy my marriage, to destroy my friendships, to destroy my future. I will not give you that power. That's the way Jesus was. He said, look, y'all can sin against me, but I know where I'm going after this. So you know what? I'm not going to let anything that you do down here affect this between me and my father. I commit myself to him who judges righteously. I'll let him judge you. You have to deal with him one day, not deal with me. And he would said, Father, forgive them. And he forgave him from his heart. All right? This, if y'all remember the example that I gave in the first week about how sin is not a line, it's a slope. Okay, if y'all remember that, this is what sin is a slope is all about. That our goal is not to say, okay, you know what? Here's a line, okay, and I didn't cross the line. I didn't uh, shoot the person, okay? I didn't rat them out to the boss. I didn't, you know, I didn't stab them in the back too. I didn't cross that line. That, there's, no, there's no line. We're talking about a slope of our goal is to get to where Christ is. And until we are forgiving from our heart the way Christ is, you know, we're still climbing that mountain. And we're not letting any bitterness, any wrath, any grudge, any resentment settle in our hearts. Practical. And I want to go very, very, very practical because I know this is one of the hardest things. So I'm going to go very quickly. Four very practical things that every single person in this room needs to do. Don't tell me I don't struggle with anger. I'm telling you. Go through this. If you don't struggle with anger, this will be a quick exercise for you. You finish it in five minutes, so no problem. You get to watch the game today, no problem. But everyone needs to go through this exercise. Four things I'm going to ask everyone to do sometime over the next couple days. Number one, quickly, identify who you're angry with. And we're going to be faithful to the process. We're not going to skip any steps. Identify who you're angry with. I said that forgiveness. You know why we mess up with forgiveness? We think, you know how sometimes you go, you see a picture of Jesus and it says, when I forgive, I forget. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I see that. When I forgive, I forget. It's a cute little picture people have in their house. Okay? And it's in quotes as if he said it sometime. He never said that. He never said that. Okay? And I, and I, I think this messes us up. And we say, I forgave them, but I can't forget. So therefore, I didn't forgive. Forgiveness and forgetting are not the same. They are not the same. And I'm going to prove to you, in fact, the exact opposite. That you need to not forget. You need to identify who sinned against you. You need to say, so-and-so hurt me. So-and-so hurt me. And you need to go through the list. Because forgetting the debt is different than canceling the debt. And we'll see that in a little bit. Start with this list of people. Go back as far as you can remember. Anyone who's ever caused you any hurt in life. A teacher, a parent, a sibling, a neighbor, uh, a priest, someone who is deceased. Doesn't matter. Go through and be faithful. And, and just to help you out here, who fits in this category? The people that you... Avoid at Thanksgiving dinner. You make sure you're not sitting next to them. You may convince yourself that you're not angry. You know you're angry. The people that you see them walk into church and you walk to the other side. The people that you just pray that you never ever see. The people, sorry to be honest, that when they fail, you smile in your heart. Outside you, but inside. Make a list of all those people. Identify each and every single one of them. Number two, determine what they owe you. Determine what they owe you. And I'll be honest, of all the steps in forgiveness, this is the one you're most likely to skip, and this is why you never really move to the real point of forgiveness. This is why we go through the motions of forgiveness, but we never truly solve it. Be clear. The master in the story didn't just say, I forgive you. He said, you owe me $10,000. I forgive you $10,000. He was very clear. What did that person take away from me? What did that person deny me an opportunity to have or to do or to be? Be very, very, very clear. Until you know specifically what has been taken from you, you're not ready to cancel the debt because you are just saying, yeah, I forgive you. And then someone tells you, you know, it was $10,000. It was $10,000. You need to know what it is you're forgiving. So be very clear and write this one down. 
You know what the person may have done to you, but what did they take from you? What is it that they owe you? General forgiveness will never, never heal specific hurts. That's why we need to be specific. General forgiveness never heals specific hurts. Number three, cancel the debt. So-and-so hurt me. This is what they took from me. Write a little note. The debt is canceled. What Jesus did. Father, forgive them. There's a famous preacher. His name is Charles Stanley. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He tells a story of how his stepfather, all right, who really messed him up in life, and how it caused him anger for so many years and bitterness and grudge and, and all kinds of problems. And he finally wanted to forgive him. So he got an empty chair. His, father, his stepfather had died at the time he did this. He got an empty chair and he sat in front of an empty chair. And he says that he sat there for hours. And he recounted all the things that his stepfather had done to him. And then in the end, he said, you don't owe me anymore. I forgive you. And he says that from that moment, the burden and the weight that was on his heart for years that had weighed him down just fell like a monkey off his back. I'm telling you, get a chair and do the same thing. Or if you're not a chair person, if you think it's a little weird, okay, do it on paper. Do it on paper. Say, so-and-so, at the bottom of your handout, didn't I put that at the bottom of your handout? Yeah, look at the bottom of your handout. I gave you something that you can say, something that you can pray, something that you can write down. So-and-so took this from me, and today I released this person from their debt. Write it down. I know people, I'll give you many options. Some people, I like things tangible. I think it's, it's good. Some people, take it, write it, and then burn it. I write down to say, my sister took this from me, I forgive her today. She no longer owes me. And she burned that thing. Or some people nail it to a cross. Or some people cut it up in a million pieces. Whatever it may be. Do something tangible that will stick in your head to say from this moment on. I'm not saying that person didn't hurt me. I'm saying I'm, 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 I'm proclaiming they did hurt me. But from this moment on, they don't owe me anything. I no longer seek payback from that person. One question that you might be asking do I need to speak to the other person who I'm forgiving? Do I need to tell this person I'm forgiving them? My honest opinion? No. At times, yes. Okay? And specifically, if they're asking you, then yes, 100%. If they're asking you forgiveness, you don't keep that a secret. Yes, you should absolutely tell them. But the majority of the time, I can see a lot more harm coming from the telling them than good. Number one, if they're not convinced that they hurt you, you just opened a discussion that you're not ready to have. And you just set yourself back. And secondly, forgiveness is not about them. It's about me. And I have to go into it the mentality that I'm not forgiving him for their sake. I'm forgiving them for my sake. So I say, if they're asking you, yes, you tell them. But if they're not asking, I'm going to say don't do it. Okay? I identify this person hurt me. I'm angry with them. This is what they took from me. I write down, cancel the debt. And here's the best part. Here's the part that if you don't do this part, you're going to struggle. Because you can do step one, two, three, and you can say, I cancel the debt. But unless you do step four, you're going to end up in the same pit tomorrow. Number four, you dismiss the case. I always wanted to be a judge. Okay? That's why I dress like one today. All right? This is your chance to be a judge. So-and-so hurt me, debt has been canceled, bang the thing, case dismissed. You know when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished. Okay, at the very end, Jesus said, it is finished. At first he said, Father, forgive them. Then at the end, he said, it is finished. These two phrases are connected together. It is finished was one word in Aramaic when Jesus spoke it, one word, which literally, the, the word literally, when you would go to prison back in the day, you would go to prison and you would have like, like, I take you to court. You uh, stole something from me. So I bring her to court, and I say, she stole something from me. The judge would write a piece of paper, say, this person, thief. The punishment, 10 years in prison. All right? Then she would go to prison. She would hand the paper to the prison guard. She would serve her 10 years. And on her way out, she'd get the paper back, stamped, it is finished. That was the word. Stamped, it is finished. Paid in full. Debt paid. 
And someone comes, I come say, hey, she owes me this. She's a criminal. Put her in jail. She holds up the piece of paper and says, nope, that has been paid. Paid in full. It is finished. Same thing we need to do. I cancel this debt. And the second that I cancel that debt, once something has been tried by a judge, it can no longer be tried again. You know why this is important? You today say, okay, I forgive this person. I just said a minute ago, forgiving and forgetting are not the same. Do you expect that you're going to say, I forgive, and you're never going to get another angry thought? Do you think that the emotion, that the feeling of anger or resentful, you think it's going to go away? Because if you do, you're sadly mistaken. I, in fact, think it's going to be the exact opposite. I think the second you say, I forgive, you should be expecting a flood of emotion. To say, you know what? He did this, and you're forgiving that? What are you thinking? He's crazy. Don't you remember? The emotion will swell. And once that emotion comes up, you've got two choices. You either open the courts back up and say, okay, bring it back on trial, or you look to that piece of paper that said, you know what? I know what he did, and I know what they took, but this, this, this trial finished on, on, on November, sorry, 9th, okay? November 9th, 2014, I mean, this case was closed, and it was thrown out, at, out, out of court. So you know what? As much as I would love to retry that person, the case has been closed, and I dismiss it. And then you got to expect the next day, that emotion is going to come back again. And the next day, and the next Thanksgiving, and the next birthday, and the next Christmas, all these things are going to come back. And you need to look back to that verdict and say, you know what? This is why, this is why I'm telling you, don't forget it. I'm not saying forget it. Be clear. So that when the emotion does come back, it's an opportunity to restate the verdict. This, this case was tried on this day, and the verdict was debt has been canceled. No longer to be tried ever again. Is this easy? Is what I'm saying easy? You hate my guts? Some of you hate my guts. But that's okay. That's okay. You won't be the first people to hate my guts, and you certainly won't be the last people to hate my guts. But deep inside, you know what I'm saying. You know that your unforgiveness is hurting you and nobody else. It's not hurting people. No, I mean, it is hurting people, but it's hurting you more than anyone else. It's hurting the people that you love the most, not the people who deserve it. And that's why I'll leave you with this verse, which is a prayer that you pray anytime you say the Lord's Prayer. In a minute right now, we're going to say this together. All right? The old English way is forgive us our trespasses, but no one knows what a trespass is. If you go to any modern version of the Bible, it'll tell you it says it this way. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know why forgiving is so important? The cruelest enemy in the universe cannot hurt you the same way you can hurt yourself by being bitter. Your worst enemy cannot hurt you and destroy your life the same way you can when you hold on to their debt. Because you right here, ladies and gentlemen, are praying. You are asking God. God is not telling you. You are asking him to forgive me the $10,000 the same way I forgive the $100. And if you're holding on and you're demanding payback, man, better for you don't say these words. You're asking. God is not telling you you're asking. Your enemy can hurt your past. You can destroy your future by holding on to unforgiveness. Your enemy can hurt you in the body. You can destroy your soul. And that's why this forgiveness stuff, we don't mess around with this stuff. I always look at it this way. My sins... And my enemy's sins. Just like, just like the parable showed us. The sins that I commit against God and one another, but sins I commit against God and the sins that you commit against me, ultimately, they will be together. And either we will throw both of them into the deepest part of the ocean and forgive them both, or we will hold on and demand payment for each one. But you will not separate them. You want your sins from the, as far as the east is from the west, you want your sins nailed to the cross, you want your sins to the deepest part of the ocean, then you learn to put other people's sins in that same place. You want payback for everything ever done to you, then you be prepared to settle accounts with your master when it comes time as well. My prayer today is that some people 
who have been struggling for years, for years, would take this formula, would take, take this and start on a life of health. I'm not saying you're going to do this. Like I always liken it to a physical, a, a physical trainer. You go to a gym, trainer says, do this on Monday, do this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday, eat this. If you do that and you continue to listen to that trainer, everything he tells you to do, I can pretty much guarantee you, unless your trainer is, is, doesn't know what he's doing, if you got a good trainer, that over the course of time, six months from now, you'll be in better shape. A year from now, you'll be in better shape. If you continue to do it, and the same thing here. we got a great trainer right here. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ is telling us, I want to get you to that place of health. And I'm telling you, these are the steps. And you continue to do this and you continue to do this. I'm not saying by tomorrow. I'm not saying by next week. Because the hurt that's happened in your life has happened over a course of many years. It's not going to go away overnight. But I'm telling you, we're going to do this, and we're going to be healthy, and we are going to stand one point in time together. We're going to look back at this day and say, this was the beginning of a journey towards health and freedom and victory over all the stuff that was holding me down for years. And you're going to see that your life, just like we talked about last week with the sexuality stuff, soar like the eagles instead of running down here with the pigs. All right? Let's stand together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. And we thank you, Lord, for canceling our debt. Lord, where would we be without your mercy for us? And how could we even stand before you now and pray unless you had forgiven us for all the impure and ugly and selfish and silly things that we do. We thank you, Lord, and we'll never stop to thank you. But we pray, Lord, that you would help us to take this step and find freedom by forgiving those who have hurt us. Let us to live free from the bitterness and the resent and, and, and the grudges that enslave us. And I pray this day, Lord, that you would really free some hearts, that you'd be working inside some hearts now and free them from the prison that anger enslaves them and holds them inside. I pray that you would give us strength that you would give us courage to face those who have offended us and to face those, those debts and to say, as you said, that, Father, forgive them and cancel their debts. We Thank you in advance, Lord, for the great work that you're going to do and the freedom that you're going to give us when we obey your word. Accept our prayers in the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the prayers of all your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all very much. Have a great week.